For Reaper Metal Productions, this is the Into the Darkness podcast series, and I'm happy to welcome back our host, Thomas. Thank you for being here. And if you've been following this channel, you will know how excited I am about today's guest, and that is Rodney from Texas Devastation, the thrash metal band that has been the soundtrack to my youth, and I am just never would have thought I would have had this opportunity to just get down and nerdy, because that's what we do here on the podcast, is it's long format interview series, and we just like to dive in there and just have conversations, because you never know. So if you're into that stuff and you're like, fuck, man, this video is just far too long, I got to get on with my day, we have the audio series. Uh, also available at ReaperMetalProductions.com, so head over there, and when you're there, there's plenty of great music to be had, as well as Redefining Darkness Records, so uh, <laughs> and I always fuck that link up, as well as my cuts there. Yeah. What is that link again? Because it's not records. Oh, it's, yeah, just Redefining Darkness. Yeah. Well, I just want to... Keep it simple. <laughs> all right, good. Yeah. Clarify all that. Well, with all that out of the way, then, <laughs> let's dive in and... I'd like to think you've been following this channel and you're like, fuck yeah, because they just had Scott Burns on there and Rodney. They, oh my God, I got to know about that because going not in chronological it's order, right. um, it's, re it's relevant. We'll start from the top, the last album from like 1991 from, at Morris Sound Studio, which sure. Scott Burns was the producer of. And being a fan that did follow Devastation's albums that, you know, had a never changing sound, really, when it fell in into Morris sound, it did kind of seem to, you know, sound like something you would expect from Scott. Oh, well, yeah. It's burned, burned, burnified. Yes. Yeah. So, Rodney, like, you know, working with Scott, like, was that like, well, how did that happen? Was was that like a conscious effort that you guys were like, fuck yeah, I can't wait to work with Scott or like... Something the label pushed for and, and yeah. how was that experience? Um, really, he had just, I mean, obviously, he was the hot guy at the moment, you know, and, um, Everything he was putting out was was sounding really good and really heavy, and he really had his pulse on the the scene at that time. And um, man, we liked it all, you know. And it just seemed like the natural course. And of course, Combat was was definitely down for as well, no problem. And uh, we really liked. I think Beneath the Remains had a really good sound. Um, that that was one of the I think biggest ones that drew us over there. Um, Everything was just so crisp and clean, and um, we totally dug it. And and uh, after meeting and working with him, man, there was just not a not nicer guy. You know that dude is just so cool and down to earth. And yeah, totally. he, he's amazing, man. Yeah, and I think that was definitely like I mean, there's something because signs of life, like you know, having like a progression, you know, discussing really the sound anyway. Like signs of life, it was definitely you know a studio quality record. It was it was heavy and stuff, but there's something like really like subsonically boomy about it. Yeah, we're like yeah, definitely by comparison, I doubt it should just really rounded it out, and it was it kind of gave that death metal uh, edge then to yeah. devastation, which was kind of interesting then because you, you know Tommy. You like this i mean this is the soundtrack to my youth man and, and right, still right. to this day you know clearly yeah um but like so talking to you about this before this interview you were right. kind of even commenting like i'm you're more so freshening up yeah. and so i thought that that was kind of interesting because you had a di kind of a different take like toward the sound like is that something though with, with the morris sound like did you notice that that quality was at there for first and foremost well i guess for me it was different because I discovered idolatry first. I already had a love for idolatry in that sound, so I already kind of, that was what I had in my head. I hadn't gone in chrono chronological order um, to kind of know the progression. Right. I just heard idolatry and was blown away just like I was when I heard, you know, the first love on creation or something. But because I didn't know Devastation's history, I did think like, oh, maybe they're super into Malevolent Creation and maybe not the other way around because right. obviously they were around first. Um, but then when you brought to my attention, just kind of like, hey, pay attention to production, do this and that. So when I went back and uh, re-listened to uh, Signs of Life, you know, recently right. when, uh, with all the knowledge we have now of audio and, <laughs> and production value and stuff, I do think Signs of Life sounds more aggressive and there are a lot more mids in there. You know, obviously stuff that we've talked about right. that were... Uh, kind of elements of Scott Burns recording where it's kind of scooped and it's that 90s uh, Morris sound sound. Uh, 
but that's what I grew up on. I grew up on more sound sound and loving everything coming out of there. But as you kind of brought to my attention, I think Signs of Life does sound more aggressive on record, mm -hmm. whereas I do and more thrashy, where I do think as idolatry did it did kind of get lumped into more of that more sound sound, which right. it sounds like that's what Rodney and them were looking for, being fans of it, which is nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I love it. But uh, it did have an effect, I think, and it did make it sound more of that kind of death thrash than maybe it, it would have otherwise. Right, right. You know, at that time we were, you know, just huge like Slayer, Dark Angel fans, and and the aggression was just, you know, natural. It, it just came when we were writing that stuff, and uh, it. I mean, I wish Signs of Life had a little better production. I mean, there's looking back, obviously, some things we could have done, you know, but it was our first album on. Combat and didn't have a lot of money, and um, you know we did the best we could. But um, I still like the aggression in that album. It, it's a uh, you know it's a barn burner from beginning to end. You know it just nonstop. It's it's pretty intense. You know. Yeah, for sure. But from like then album wise, because like you know yeah being on combat maybe because you know violent op termination obviously led to signs of life and then idolatry it seems like you know kind of even talking to tommy and being that nerd like i was just blinded to the fact that perhaps idolatry might have been more the the you know when you your your biggest moments uh, your milestone moment like w was yeah. that for sure yeah it, without a doubt i mean we um every album is so different with us that yeah. that's what's very weird i mean if you look back in the history um but but with idolatry yeah when we were finished i mean we really we were really proud for the first time i mean we knew that we had something and we had good songs and um we didn't really sound like anyone else per se at that time um it sort of thrash death metal but not really because the vocals weren't death metal vocals right but, but just balls out heavy you know it just some of those riffs on there are just bludgeoning you know yeah. and and, um, and the songwriting too had really progressed we we were more writing songs now than just trying to like pound you to death with speed and yeah. aggression and there's some some songs with some catchy lyrics and some choruses and, and um, you know which when you go back to the beginning of everything that's what it's about you know that's what music right. is about trying to write a song you know i think through the years that's been taken out of a lot of the extreme metal music you, they just want to be as heavy as they can be for heavy sake and yeah and what have you but but um yeah it was a defining moment we knew we had written a great record and and man we were ready to go but it just came out at the wrong time I and mean, combat 91 was just everything was turning into grudge and tours were getting canceled and metal was definitely sliding to the back burner and um you know what can i say if that album would have come out maybe 87 88 shit who knows but uh it just for us the timing it was just a little bit too late you know right but and so by which do you mean because obviously that's the last album that the band in, in inevitably has done was like for it to be a milestone then yeah how did that then fall was it because of grunge and stuff or was it more internal reasons um good question there, there's a lot to that to be honest we um we kind of made our bread and butter with spring um we weren't really the, the best musicians by any means, and um, but but live, you know, we were into playing live, and we could really bring it live, and we could hold our own with anyone. I mean, we played early on with Death and Dark Angel, yeah, and um, you know, we we had guys coming up to us after the the show and like, man, you guys are just intense live. I mean, you you know, I mean, Death in the beginning was known for just standing there and they didn't move and look like statues. And <laughs> don't get me wrong, Death Death was great, and I love them, one of my favorite bands, but. But but live we brought this intensity to it that um, that that was just uh, I'm not going to say unmatched but I mean we were we were really into that and and uh, we did several tours for Signs of Life uh, uh, maybe five or six national tours and um, it was time to come to tour for Idolatry and just nothing was happening and our booking agent was trying to get us on some tours and a lot of tours were canceling and and um, so we just finally went out on our own. Uh, we don't really think we were ready to headline, but looking back, I mean, I'm glad we did it because that ended up being the last tour. You know, he, he put together a package of us, Malevolent Creation, and Demotion Hammer, which, you know, that was a brutal tour for yeah. 91. And, oh, yeah, um, same. Uh, you know, not not necessarily saying we were ready to headline, but we did it because that was the only choice we had, and, and it ended up being like 75 shows 
in 78 days and wow. it was it was pretty amazing man well it's, you know and speaking of that yeah the intensity and all that because on this channel there we post those old vhs tapes and stuff so check them out there's plenty to be had there and devastation's one of them i want to say it's 1985 um in corpus christi and you know this is before everything that you're describing but even then it's just like holy shit like how's your neck doing because after you watch that it's just w- you know windmills and stuff like everybody like just pure aggression so like i have, have you had problems with your neck though and stuff through headbanging through the years uh, knock on wood no not, not <laughs> lately or not recently but uh, there was times back then that it you know it it acted up a little bit but yeah it's um yeah it was a lot of headbanging a lot of thrashing yeah just intensity you know because i think we grew up to as fans you know back in corpus christi where the metal scene wasn't the biggest and you know shows the underground shows we had to travel usually to san antonio to see but um you know going to see like metallic on the ride of the lightning towards i mean we were just kids we would get up there we wanted to be front row and you know we were like the europe kids we were just headbanging and going crazy and and you know that carried on until when we formed a band and um you know it's just like we're just a bunch of kids up there thrashing around having a good time to be honest with you i mean yeah well, one of the things I wanted to go get back well, I to I want to go back to that tour. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually read a cool interview with you, Rodney, preparing for this. And uh, you had mentioned on that headlining tour with Love and Creation and, and Demolition Hammer supporting that you guys were in a van and those guys were actually like on buses and stuff. So is that <laughs> yeah, just because yeah. Combat wasn't giving tour support at that time? Or were they just kind of um, stingy with they, the funds? They gave or? tour support, but it was, it was very minimal. It, and it was like we were kind of always, to be honest, um, we were kind of slighted by combat because the dude who signed us was Scott Gibbons, who also signed Dark Angel. Right. So that was his, you know, he was into obviously intense, fast, aggressive music. Well, shortly after signing us, he bailed. Uh, he went to another label. I forget which one. But so, like, we're there and, you know, kind of like a foster band, you know. Right. Uh, who's going to take care of Devastation? Nobody really <laughs> put a lot of time, effort, anything into it. So... Uh, they did give us tour support, but, you know, we would see other bands with, you know, big full-page ads back at the time in whatever the magazine was, Metal Maniacs, Rip, or whatever. And then, you know, we got a little quarter-page ad with somebody else. And uh, even for idolatry, you know, the, the promotion was very lackluster and very uh, um, below average for, for uh, something at that time. But, yeah, that that tour, we, we had a van because Dave Burke, the guitar player, had a van. Um and yeah, the at Malibu, there was no buses per se. That wasn't right. But yeah, Demolition Hammer did pull up in a big RV, pulling a trailer, and okay. you know, so uh, Century Media was definitely pouring money into them, helping them out, and and then Malevolent was on, I guess, Road Racer, and and they they had a van and trailer too. Um, so, um, but yeah, we were you know we were the headliner, and we were just you know six guys in a van, but you know it didn't stop us. We didn't care. Right. You know, it's just all about playing live, whatever it took. You know? When you were talking about idolatry and, and talking about, you know, how he'd kind of this whole death thrash thing and, and um, but the vocal approach was obviously always different. Something that I noticed since we're on idolatry yeah. still is um, even though obviously you were a precursor to this band, I noticed a lot of like, at least personally, I hear a lot of Chuck Billy in the vocal. I don't know if he was an influence or like who influenced you, but I'd kind of like to ask you um your progression throughout the albums, obviously, you got better and better and more comfortable. Um, not being a singer, obviously, um, coming into it and just doing what you had to do. But I did notice um, when you compare yourself to other maybe Texas thrash or even other thrash in the U.S., your vocals, even from the beginning, even from um, Violent Termination, Termination it always sounded more uh, like punk influence like uh like the venice bands it reminded me of the kind of the crossover vocal uh, which i thought was cool i mean you could hear it um it, it kind of had more of that dri excel suicidal kind of vibe uh, especially at the beginning and then obviously you progressed and you were talking about writing songs and and paying more attention to the vocals and, and the choruses and that kind of thing so in ninety in ninety one when you did idolatry, obviously that was probably something that you were uh, working on. But was it something that Scott Burns helped with? Is that something that you just developed on your own? And I guess explain more of that progression of the vocals from album to album. Okay, well, if you want to go back to the very very beginning, as as it started out, 
Dave Burke and me started down. Well, Dave, Dave asked me to sing for this new band he wanted to make because, and like I was going back from Corpus Christi, there was no original metal bands except one, this band called Final Assault. And they were like a Iron Maiden type band, um, really good singer, did the Jeff Tate vocals, um, and they were really rising, getting big in San Antonio. They were, I mean, excuse me, Corpus, they were opening for, you know, Metal Church, Inge Malmsteen. So he just up and quit right at the, their peak when they were really doing well and getting a lot of attention because he wanted to do something heavier, something more aggressive. And so he approached me, hey, I want to start like a thrash band. Do you want to sing? And I'm like, uh, no, man, I can't sing. I never have. But I'll help you because I was helping Final Assault. I was helping them get the shows and stuff like that. I'll help manage the band. And he's like, well, dude, why don't you just try to sing? Because in this thrash, you don't really need good vocals. Well, so Dave was going from something that was established and doing a lot of good stuff to now starting over. So he was like, didn't have the most patience, let's say. Okay. So I look, look back. Um, we didn't have the normal progressions, I think, that bands have when you start out because Dave wanted to, to really do stuff. I don't know if it was a competitive edge maybe with Final Assault. Or, so he was like, you know, we just didn't get into the practice room and, and jam covers and stuff like that. And now looking back in retrospect, I think that was really kind of hurting me because I had never sang anything in my life, never right. once opened my mouth to sing. And so he's writing these original songs, and he's like, here, you throwing them at me, like, put some vocals to this. <laughs> and if you go back to Violent Termination, it, I, I, the only thing I like about that album is the music, not the vocals, but <laughs> the music was actually, there was a lot of original stuff on that album because it didn't really fit a mold. Some yeah. of it was really heavy. Some of it was trashy. Some of it was just bizarre. I mean, Dave always had a special way of writing. So he, he's given me these songs, put some vocals to them, and I don't know what to do. I mean, yeah, there was some hardcore influence. I mean, I loved, like, Chromags. I loved yeah. um, DRI, CLC, early COC. These things I did love. But so I'm just not knowing what to do, you know. And that 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 was the result, to be honest with you. I wish we had spent months and months doing covers of Metallica or Slayer or Holocaust, Witchfinder General, so I could maybe develop some sort of style because I had none. And there, you see, so that was going into that um, – Recording of Violent Termination was our very, very first time in the studio. Like, the demo, the two demos we put out before that, they're just us practicing and our friend coming over with the boom box, holding okay. a mic, you know. Total Re rehearsal old tapes, so yeah. Those, those, yeah, those are about as low rent as you can get. And if you listen to them, <laughs> you can tell that. But so here, now I'm in the studio, and, you know, we got these original songs, and I don't know what to do. So I'm basically trying to tell you why the vocals are shitty, and they suck. But, <laughs> so they're going on for like, the, the signs of life. Signs of life, I got a little more comfortable. Um, the aggression was there, so I could feel more like there was a need for maybe a lot more yelling and, and, and screaming type stuff. But still, like, you know, I can't carry a tune, per se, like Bruce Dickinson or anything. So, again, making the best with, with what I had. And then, finally, on the idolatry, I really did... Um, I, I was influenced a lot by, by Don Doty and, and Jeff was... I really like Jeff Becerra a lot, and and to me, some of the idolatry I hear a little Jeff Becerra here and there. I, no one's ever said the Chuck Billy, and man, that would be a huge comment because obviously that guy's a professional singer. But uh, thanks for that. But to me, I, I was kind of like feeling like Don Doty, Jeff Becerra. I just wanted to just I was happy if I could make somehow the vocals fit with the music. And finally, on the third album, I think I accomplished that. If they could have been a little better on the second album, mixed with a little better production, I think that album may have took off and, and uh, done something as well. But, you know, it was always like I, I felt crappy because, in a way, I would always tell Dave, like, man, I feel like I'm holding you guys back. But at the other end of it, there was a lot of other things that I did offer for the band. I always tell people, like, I was the, like, Lars Ulrich of the band, you know? I yeah. didn't have the talent, but, man, I was a hustler. You know? <laughs> right. I what do you get mean? A, get a show. Lars is talented. Us, you know, get us record deals, stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean, there is a little bit to be uh, said for having that enthusiasm and that, sure. you know, ambition. But, uh, yeah, in the, in the bottom line, you know, it, a, a real singer may have took this band to 
crazy level. Who knows, you know? Well, uh, if I was going to say, actually, uh, you seem more like the Reed Mullen <laughs> going by his story, like booking shows and stuff and <laughs> right, rally or whatever. Right. And it's just a better drummer to, because, well, he did have the talent. <laughs> yeah, he had the talent. <laughs> In drummer world, especially. But, um, you know, that's, uh, I just really wanted to focus. I'm glad we went there, though, because I, like, I yeah, when you said, <laughs> yeah, well, because when you said that, like, too, I'm like, Chuck, Billy, like, and then yeah. now. Like I, I can kind of see it where then Rodney it's, just said um, uh, Don, uh, Don Doty. Doty. I'm yeah. like, I can kind of see too. that because I never thought about it. Because I just it's, like it's, it's devastation. Cadence. It's like his cadence. Like you could tell oh. he's like really paying attention. Um, because before, like he said, I think he was just trying to be aggressive and, and yeah. doing what he, what he thought was right, and and it fit in Signs of Life. And I I, th- I even liked the Violent Termination sound. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But obviously there was a progression, and yeah, it was just the way it, it was almost just like um, uh, like detailing everything he already done. Everything he already done was still there. It was still aggressive. It was still cool. But it was almost like he was just like adding this extra element to kind of go to that next level. Yeah, and it's just like the little cadences sound very like uh, I don't know banshee like like uh, Chuck Billy would do. Okay. I, I was just a huge Testament can, fan, so it's easy for me. I to can kind of I can see it, yeah. but I think that's what the point of like what the character is. It yeah. is like I don't, I can't put my finger on it. Right. It's it's unique in every aspect that can be categorized as something else. You know yeah. what I mean? But when you put it all in a grinder and shake it, it's just devastation vocals. Right. And then then you get the each album something different. And so we have kind of said stuff about signs of life and definitely because we're there you know uh, uh, chronologically in our conversation violent termination you know from the sound up there's just something yet very primitive about it and very uh there's just a a, there's a a weird like disconnect almost like between like you know like when you listen to an album and it's like full of like lyrics and thanks lists and, and and uh you know band photos i think it like pulls you in and it has those but somehow there's like a disconnect for me i don't know why i just think and, and it might be the cover because that's really just at least where i want to go like devoid of anything i just said there is because on, on idolatry you see it and it's a drawing where on violent termination like you'd think okay cool you can come up with a mascot where violent termination is like a freaking national geographic photo of like a skull or something it looks yeah. brutal it looks like and maybe that's the disconnect because there's something like just kind of like i don't know mysterious yeah, or, yeah visceral like right. yeah uh, about it uh so first off like where the hell did you get that cover <laughs> that's funny um so in going back to corpus obviously where we're from uh after we started, um, about a year later, a punk band came up called Anchor Watt, who later got signed on, on uh, Death Records, Metal Blade, yeah. what have you. And um, we, we did several shows with them. They were cool guys. And uh, Danny Loner, a friend of mine, lived like two streets over from me. Um, I don't know. I was at his house one day. I don't know if Anchor Watt was practicing or we were just hanging out. But um, he had this picture on his wall, and it was that picture of that skull. And I was like, wow, man, that's intense. Because I think after I read the article, it was maybe um, from the the Holocaust or something. Huh. Um, they just lined people up and shot them. And I think on one of those skulls, you can see the bullet hole in the head. You know, and right? Like, yeah. Man, you know that that thing decayed and the blindfold was still left on it. You know, yeah. It was just it was just really intense. You know, at the at the time. So of course, Danny said, "Dude, yeah, take it if you want to use it for your cover or whatever." Huh. And um, so we did. And, um, that's the history behind that. It was just, in, in fact, it, it could have been out of a National Geographic or some kind of. It definitely was out of some sort of history magazine, but um, yeah, it's like really it was good quality. Really, yeah, yeah. It it was intense, man. It it was uh, it was really cool, and it just captured. And then obviously, we kind of kept that little skull guy as a mascot throughout the time. The skull guy with the blindfold, and uh, yeah, kept using that. But um, so it was yeah, the Danny, photo. Danny had that hanging in his room. Wow, so it was the photo right. that implanted that planted the seed to even have a mascot. It was never an affir- uh, afterthought before that to be like, "Hey, we got this oh, skull no, idea." No, no, it just no. In fact, when we were doing the second the second album, uh, that's when we thought about it. Like um, this, oh, this yeah. uh, local guy was local guy was doing the cover for the second album, and I won't mention that guy's name because he's a he's a jerk off. He's ripped off a lot of people <laughs> around here, so. <laughs> But anyway, I don't want to give him it's a, any. Props. It's a great cover, but yeah, but, that um, sucks. <laughs> so yeah, when the cover was, when it was kind of done, and we were like, "Hey, man, it'd be cool if you could kind of like make that dude laying across the thing, 
make it like he was opening up the scroll and it has that skull from the first album, you mm-hmm. know? Just, I don't know, for shits and grins or whatever, it. but... Uh, so, so he put oh, it in shit. there. Oh, shit. Yeah, on the scroll, it. yeah. Dude, I never fucking noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> that's really? what I was, was saying. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, holy shit, there's something on that scroll. I never yeah. fucking noticed that. Yeah. yeah let me hold wow. it up on it's like camera. It kind of tied in with, because that, that Signs of Life song was about, you know, some futuristic end of the world bullshit. And, um, and yeah, and it's kind of like this guy, as he's read, that's when he dies. That's oh. reading that, and he sees that skull, which represents past history, you know? So it's kind of it kind of ties in, you know. It's pretty cool. Obviously, no one got it. If he did it, so <laughs> yeah. Craig, it Craig missed it completely. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I did. I, I mean, I did have a conscious effort of, of thinking because I, like my yeah, I, 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 uh, Violent Termination was the first Devastation album I heard. I don't know if it went in chronological order from there, but definitely when I saw Signs of Life cover, I did wonder what the hell happened to the Skull guy because uh-huh. I at least knew. About, okay, so maybe I, I at least knew about idolatry then to know like, hey, it's been on it's that there, cover. Yeah. Why it's not in there? But then to have it thrown oh, in there, okay. I, I don't know. I guess it was always there. So I'm just the moron. <laughs> um, but it's cool that you like were. You were thinking what was I was thinking yeah. you should have done, <laughs> and you just still did it. Right a little, from... <laughs> little more subdued, kind of subliminal. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, but it was even like on the well. So hold on a second though, because I'm more and more confused than about these demos. Because first off, we got I got three of them here, and then contamination. I already know that this is not like in the order of like pre-album. Like this is between four signs of life. Yeah, but it's then after uh, violent termination album. Yeah. But then if you didn't have the skull guy. Well, then what was up with Destined to Death? Like, how did... I mean, it's not the skull well, that we saw. Well, I guess you were already it's, thinking it's skull, skulls. But, yeah. Yeah, it's a skull, but no blindfold. You know, it was before we saw that picture. But, you know, that that logo is, is uh, I don't know, almost dates, per se, getting the Destruction album and, and tracing the skull. You know, it was like <laughs> It looks so, like it. Uh, yeah, it's say. exactly it. <laughs> it is it. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, I've never it, seen this actually. It see? is exactly destruction. <laughs> <laughs> oh here, let me. Yeah, hear. it's. Oh, there you go. In Boom. like nineteen eighty eighty five or eighty six, whenever that was. Infernal done. Overkill, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah, in Corpus Christi, <laughs> nobody's heard of, of destruction metal. You know, there was like three people in the underground Fuck metal. It. So you know, I'm not saying he had tracing paper, but he definitely looked at it as he drew it. That's pretty uh, cool. Uh, it's it's evident now. But yeah, if that, another thing that went over my head—that's not even. So Rodney, part. were these uh, the rehearsal tapes you were talking about? Is this just boom boxes yeah, in that, a room? That's nothing more than yeah, practicing. And, but the best of the death are the five first five songs we have wrote. Then the violent termination demo or the next—I don't remember how many are on that one. Five or six. Those are the next five or six songs we wrote, and then out of those, we picked what we thought were the best to, to make the album. This one so, has yeah, those seven. Are just, um, Four guys in a in in Dave Burke's bedroom, and our friend came over with a boombox and a microphone, and there you go. Okay. But we did do professional covers, all, you know. Yeah. That was, yeah. 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 And then and then ripped off destruction. Did uh, <laughs> and ripped off destruction. Yes. W- so I, I'm still kind of confused because some of this is shrouded in mystery because at least per Metal Archives, either, there's no mention of a violent termination demo. And maybe I'm just another jackass where I never knew for years there was a Violent Termination demo either until my friend yeah. who's a Devastation fanatic, uh, shout out to Jeff, um, he, uh, he he hooked it up and I'm like, what the hell? But then even furthermore, yeah. you said that there, uh, I, I think you said there's even another recording that you have on just like some old reels that nobody's ever heard. Yeah, it's, it's the same five songs as that Contaminated demo, but... Um we recorded them in Corpus at the first uh, at the studio where we did the first Violent Termination, and then um, yeah, we didn't give it to anyone. I, I sent one to a friend of mine, Walt, who was guitar player for Riding Porch at the time. Um, I said, "Dude, check out the new, new the new songs we got." You know, and he was like, "Dude, that sounds like total shit." Man, that, <laughs> that ain't worth, you know, that's just horrible. You guys got to produce this correctly. And I go, "What do you mean? We thought it sounded great because to me it sounds like." Seven churches or something. It's just brutal. It's yeah. so fast and extreme and heavy. And he's like, no, man, this sounds like dog shit. You guys come up here and let's, let's re-record it. So he um, he was good friends with the kids in Pantera. Obviously, this was before they got big. Glamterra. So yeah. their, um, their dad had a studio in Arlington, 
called Pantigo. So we huh. went up there for the weekend, and we recorded those same five songs over again with um, Daryl and, and Vinny's dad now producing Crazy. it. And, um, and it did sound, you know, better. And Because and, uh, this guy was a professional engineer. Right. Like, mostly he did... He worked with country, country western, artists. Yeah. He knew metal because of his his kids, you know. I yeah. Think Pantera, they probably had their first two or three albums out by that time. Yeah. Well, see, so, they recorded uh, everything there. Yeah. With with yeah. At their studio. Yeah. So um, and actually, Vinny they had it. I mean, we didn't advertise or anything because you know he was nobody back then. But Vinny had a little hand in production on that contaminated demo because he was doing some of the engineering. But uh, that's the contaminated demo is the one that we sent to. Um, to combat, combat that got assigned and yeah it was crazy i mean i literally sent out three demos i sent out to metal blade megaforce and combat and and within a week we got a call back from combat and hmm. um you know the rest is history that's pretty awesome i noticed so something i want to i want to get some help with when we're talking about chronological and what happened we here and there use all the help we can get yeah um so be, if we kind of go chronologically and obviously, there were rehearsal demos. There's Violent Termination, which was self-released. Then you did Contaminated um, twice, I guess, now that we're discovering. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you yeah. did um, uh, Signs of Life after getting uh, after getting signed to combat and whatnot. Well, I noticed uh, Dave Lozano was on Contaminated, and then Louis on Signs of Life, but then Dave's back on Idolatry. I don't know if you can shed some right. light. I don't know if you know this, but I actually know Dave... Um, I toured in a in a band from 2007-2009, and obviously, as you know, I don't know if you still talk to him, but he's always on the road. He was, like, tour managing. He was stage manager. Probably almost every tour I've been on, he's been on the same tour. So I've known Dave for, for quite a while. He's always been good to me, so I can't really say anything here or there. But uh, I was just curious, like, why Uncontaminated? Why did, he, why did he leave, or why did he get kicked out? And then, obviously, you, get, you brought him back, so... Well, I guess yeah. what was that whole story? Um, let's see. If I can remember correctly, because, yeah, we did go through drummers quite frequently, like Spinal Tap. So it was like <laughs> um, we started with Jesse Lopez, who was on, on uh, Violent Termination. Then we got rid of him and went to, I want to say that we went to Dave Lozano um, after that. And then he was in there for that contaminated demo. And then... I, I don't know. Back then, there wasn't real problems with him. I mean, I know, I think at the time, he didn't have a drum set or something. And uh, I don't know, but um, we we just, uh, Jason McMaster had, had recommended me this guy uh, named Paul Kopchinski who lived up in Baltimore. And he had, I think he had played with Hollow's Eve and, and maybe someone else. And he was a real, like a Gene Hoagland clone. He was a real good wow. friend of Gene Hoagland. So um, we thought, wow, well, we got a record deal with... Um, combat we need this badass drummer who's like gene hoagland's buddy you know so let's so we drove up to baltimore brought him back tried him out and um yeah he was a good drummer but totally totally did not fit our style you know we were just um man we're very loose and mellow and just you know let go at it and he would like practice do one song and then needed like a five minutes to towel off and get some water and a snack and <laughs> we were used to like just busting through the set you know, two or three times in a row, you know, so right. he just didn't fit. So we got rid of him. And then I think, um, obviously didn't want to ask Dave back then because of I, the first time I don't remember if he quit, I, I guess we kicked him out, but I, the reasons why I really don't remember, I, I have no idea. Um, so we brought in Louie who was from San Antonio. So he, he was not an original Corpus guy. He was from San Antonio and he had played in a couple of bands like uh, death tripper and hell dogs and, some stuff like that. So um, but he was a friend of ours, real cool guy, and he did fit our, our style and our personality. You know, it just, you know, we were young, and, and we just wanted someone who was our friend and would mesh with us, you know? Right. And it wasn't necessarily about having the best drummer. It was just the coolest guy who fit with us. So, and that turned out to be Louie. So we recorded Signs of Life with Louie. Well, um, so Louie did the majority of our touring with us because I think on the Signs of Life album we must have toured like i said five or six times so louis was kind of just the mainstay the guy that everybody on the road knew and our friends fans knew and and he was just the guy the drummer but then for some reason louis when we were writing the idolatry album i'm not going to say he, he wasn't comfortable 
comfortable or he wasn't, but like the music was definitely going up a notch. It was getting better and more professional and, and everything was going to be, and then he heard we were going to be recording with Scott Burns and I don't know, he just, I don't, I'm not saying if he wasn't ready for it or didn't want to do it or, but he just like, we we're all the best friends, but he just backed out and said, you know, guys, I just maybe get somebody else to do it. Wow. And then, so we're back to that level. And then, um, you know, we thought, well, you know, Dave was always a good drummer. He was solid and he could really put off. It. And, and Dave kept getting better. So um, by this time now, Dave was, I forget what local band he was in, but he was in a band and we, somebody had seen him live and, you know, he was really good now, fast double bass and just everything was going. So we asked him and, and he came back in and, uh, yeah, we recorded Idolatry with him, you know. Well, so... You know, you talked a lot about a bunch of really, uh, I guess, scene people that would comprise what is really the Texas scene. And and I think it's proper to say Texas scene rather than like specific cities as, well, states get weird, you know, you got, right. but you got specific things like, you know, Florida death metal, Swedish death metal and stuff like that, that still is just as broad. So I think it's appropriate to say Texas scene because... You know, you just kind of described, like, A, the Pantera guys, like, helping, you know, record, and then, you know, obviously Devastation is entirely different, Anchor What, and then Rotting Corpse, like, all these bands are just so drastically different, Rigor Mortis, Rigor Mortis yeah. like, it's all just so drastically different, yet it's all very much the scene mentality, it's, everybody's, like, kind of, you know, rooting for each other, that's why Pantera guys, you know, they're doing what they could do, they, re they record, you know, and, like, you know, they're, they're all playing a part so it's very much still a scene but it's just so diverse like what do you texas is like a goddamn country man Those yeah cities are far apart well, you know? do you think it's that dynamic of texas yeah. that well do you even agree with that statement for one and do you think it's the dynamic of texas oh, I... being so vast right no i 100 percent agree with that in fact i used to tell people like when when all this was forming you know like you know obviously 82 83 the first wave was metallica but then after that you know, the 85, 86 time, you know, Exodus, Testament, all that. The Bay Area, it kind of had a sound, you know. It, you know, yeah. that Bay Area sound. And New York sort of had a sound, the overkill, anthrax, whatever. Right. But I would always tell people, man, Texas was so diverse. You have, you know, Balls Out, Thrash, Riding Corps. You have Pantera, what they were doing at the time. More or less was Def Leppard Glam before they got heavy. Right, you know? yeah. <laughs> then you have, you have Hellstar out of Houston. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal for traditional metal, you know. But oh, then yeah. you go like to Austin, you got Watchtower, and you can't even put words on what Watchtower right. was doing. I mean, it was like <laughs> Rush meets Angel Witch meets, you know, uh, whatever. It was the most technical stuff anyone had ever heard. Yeah. And um, but yet it was a big scene, and everyone was all together. You know, you, there was definitely shows: the uh, Watchtower, Devastation, and Riding Corpse, or wow. Hellstar. San Antonio Slayer and and the Offenders, you know, which was an old punk band from. I mean, so San Antonio really, I mean, excuse me, Texas really was diverse, but we were also unified, and there was never a feeling of competition or never a feeling of anything. Like I find it super strange that in in the small city of Corpus Christi, which um, you know was only two hundred thousand people in nineteen eighty six. I mean, there was four bands. They got signed to underground metal at the wow. same time. We were on combat. Uh, Anchor Watt got signed to Death Record, which was a subsidiary of Metal Blade. It was their hardcore division. Final Assault struck a deal with Azure Records. They got this real rare shaped picture disc out that's rare as hen's teeth. And then um, even in the later 80s, like maybe 89, Annihilator signed to Wild Yeah, Rats, yeah, yeah. Uh, Annihilator with the different spelling. Yeah. So, like, out of that tiny city, you had four bands that were on, you know, decent underground labels and very strange and bizarre. And yeah, all of us played together, did shows together. There was never any animosity or, or anything. You know, it was it was great times. But the diversity is key. It was, you know, none of the bands really sounded alike. You know, from right, Hellstar, no. Rigor Mortis, Pantera, they got their own sound. You know. But it was there was like a the thing that I think the thread that. <clears throat> really did kind of bring you all together was that aggression and that intensity and not to say that the barrier didn't have it or, or whatever but texas is just different oh, you yeah. almost had like this death thrash before death thrash um so you guys took it to a different level whether you're talking you rigor mortis even watchtower maybe they didn't go that direction but they pushed the boundaries far in in a, in a direction oh yeah and so i think texas to not me about, was 
always more extreme one way or the other. But you had mentioned, I think, in an interview, something about McAllen being pretty wild. Um, I've actually played down there, too. It's pretty uh, – it's like a different place. It's like you're in Mexico. It's so far well, down. But uh, That's a key yeah, was there there. A, was there a band from McAllen that had come up or that was – Kind of in um, that scene too. There's a death, a death metal band. Maybe Craig knows or one of the brothers because I know Jamie always tells me you guys are the death metal gods. But <laughs> there was a band called Severance from down there. Yes. You remember them? Yeah, I was just, yeah, I was trying, I was, when McAllen. you were just saying uh, Annihilator, uh, wasn't one of the guys an Annihilator for Severance? Or am uh, I thinking of Sacrament? Oh, no. That was, well, they had a band called Sintegrity later, but mm, Severance still not was, so. oh, Sufferance. 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 Yeah, they had a demo out. That's what yeah. I was thinking of. I don't Severance, know Severance then. Severance, all the guys were from McAllen. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know I don't know that one. I was thinking of Sufferance. Yeah, they got that one uh demo tape and it's got like the drawing of the dude like ready to behead yep. somebody on a, a log. Okay. Yeah. Dude, that's and that but one's yeah, fucking McAllen, brutal too. Yeah. Dude, that's a heavy They're fucking brutal, like dude, the, the vocals on it are just fucking extreme like for, for thrash. Yeah. Man, you want some pissed off vocals? That guy he's not happy on that day. <laughs> <laughs> so what where who was the band I guess that paved the way? Was it I mean, because you guys were all so spread out. Obviously, these cities are all like two to four hours away from right, each other. Right, right. But well, you mentioned Watchtower. I think they started, what, 83 or something? Was that Meltdown demo somewhere around that time? Uh, is that 80, is that the one that was even, like yeah. blowing the doors um, off or what? So the earliest, earliest stuff was um, like Watchtower was 82. Hellstar goes back to even 81. Oh, wow. Um, San Antonio Slayer is around 82. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, yeah. Let's, uh pantera of course first album was 83 yeah. um so but for me personally um i think hellstar was the first big big band from texas that i really got into and then of course the san antonio slayer ep was totally phenomenal um but those are the early 80s those are the front runners you know um probably hellstar watchtower san antonio slayer and then up from dallas area um there was a band called Warlock that was pretty early, uh, pretty early. 80s. Was Rigor Mortis eighty three? Did they? No, that was later than that. That was uh, more like eighty eight. I think uh, eighty five. Maybe eighty five. Well, maybe their, their formation, but I thought the album was like more like eighty eight by the time the, the, the first album. The album is eighty eight. Okay. Is yeah, it 88? I yeah. I think their first demo was 86, yeah. Yes, yes. The demo is definitely 86, which if you guys don't know or anybody watching, they, they put that out, the demo, on a CD. It's oh, yeah. It's fucking awesome. I actually have it, too. And then uh, Freaks apparently had a, a recording, because if you know anything about Rigor Mortis, um, they had Bruce Corbett, the singer, on, yeah. on freaking self-titled album. Then the second out release, Freaks, he's not on. Yeah. So, and then they got a different... They, there were two guitar players at that time. I forgot his name um, that's on there. Uh, but then Bruce apparently did the Freaks songs, and there's a demo of that, and then they released that, too. Nice. So it's fucking awesome. You get to hear the Freaks EP with, with Bruce. Bruce on it. Um, but, you know, it's just another drastically different... Because even, like, you know, Hellstar keeps coming up. Yep. Like, they're Actually, not like... I work with the guys from Hellstar. Oh, right. What is that band? Uh, there's a band. I don't know if you're familiar, Rodney. There's a band called um, The Scourge. The Scourge. The oh, Scourge. I've heard the name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I released yeah. that on one of one of the labels I I operate, and um, two of the guys, and they're younger guys, oh, cool. maybe a little younger than me. I'm about forty, and they're they're probably about five yeah. years uh, uh, younger than me. But they're in the kind of new formation of Hellstar with a couple of the original guys doing yeah, tours now. Yeah, I definitely heard the name, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying good, to... Good Texas Thrash again. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm trying to crack this code then, because okay. you said a key word of the, the Mexican approximation, and like, well, so... McAllen's right there. I mean, it's... Right, so I have to first clarify if you agree with my hypothesis yeah. about the Mexican scene, because, like, I think, you know... I think Brazil's kind of a lot of time hailed for like just it's fucking sheer just you know I, sure it's got like amateur production and, and a lot of what amateur surrounding primal, the reason yeah. throughout it but it's so primal yeah. in attitude and stuff and, and so brutal and a lot of people I think hail like you know early Sepultura and the Brazilian stuff for that but I think them. like when you go to Mexico man like Mortuary Shub Negroth yeah. like there's something even more like just Ah, I, I, visceral is a great word. Visceral is a good word. Uh, something about them, but there's something about the Mexican sound, like uh, or just. And so I, I think. Well, I don't does that know. have any what influence, you, yeah. Rodney? Is that were you guys looking? I mean, to Mexico the Mexican the scene is is. I mean, 
it, it's great. I, I, I could kind of tell you a funny story that you mentioned Mexico. It's a little off topic, but um, just I'll, real quick, my uh, my daughter was like maybe six or seven, right? And and they were having a thing at school where they were talking about what their um, dads did, you know? And um, she had seen some videos of us playing Mexico to these huge crowds, like two or 3,000 people, you know? <laughs> and um, so, you know, the kids are like, well, my dad's a cop, my dad's a baker, whatever. And she goes, uh, my dad plays music in a rock band. And, and the teacher was like, oh, really? Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> she goes, well, what's the name? And my daughter said, devastation and the, the lady was like hmm oh never heard of them and my yeah. daughter said well they're really big in mexico <laughs> it was like it was hilarious man but so yeah that scene the the mexican kids man they love the the metal music they and you mentioned mcallen we played down there um one of the first times we played down there was we were opening for king diamond and trouble Wow. And for some reason or another, Trouble didn't make it down there. I don't know if their van got messed up or what. But So the promoter told us, man, you got to play extra. And we're like, well, we only have so many songs because this was like 86 or 87, real early in our career. So we went back out and played three songs that we had already played before. And they were just going like, ape <laughs> shit, nuts. I mean, it's always, we've always had a good following in Mexico. Mexico and, and South Texas border and um, those kids they really love the metal and they're they're avid fans they really are I mean and it, we would go back and headline shows in Mexico I mean uh, in McAllen off of that just the Violent Termination album and and get three or four hundred people at a show and wow. you know sell a hundred albums I mean it was just in, insane for back then but yeah, they they are intense, man. Those those they're real fans, you know. And it's it's like still present too, because what's that fest? Destroying Texas. Oh, uh, that's got more like the bestial Sounds kind of right. stuff, and you know, like, and and that's kind of the point. Like, it's got more of just you know, the, just brutal shit, like right. of more modern day. That it's like I, it's just always kind of been in the air. Well, I mean, look, Absu. I mean, like, I mean, they were yeah, kind of oh, yeah, yeah. really, you know, when they when they came through. So, yeah. And cutting edge might be the 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 best term because like ahead. I was gonna say because like Hellstar like it's not brutal right. but like the musicianship's just phenomenal. Well, he's saying eighty one. I mean, yeah, that's early. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, th- I was always kind of. You know, th- it's cool to hear that confirmed that my thoughts are at least have some sort of substance to them. Yeah. To them, but um, so signs of life. Then we we, we kind of skipped it a little bit. Um. <laughs> You know, we talked we, about the art. Yeah, we did talk about the art, but you know, we, we you got the double demo tape and stuff. Like, ha, do you a agree though, like with the subsonic quality? Because this has been reissued a few times, and like when it comes to the CD, I've got Century Media. We're right here. I'm holding the original LP, and I've never really been that nerd that uh, was always seeking originals because for the sake of being cool. And then recently, I finally just got because I'm like when it comes to LPs, like if it's something I really really like, like Devastation, I want like everything, okay, you know. So like there's certain, and then it's usually older bands then that kind of are hit me that way. And so like when I finally got a copy of Sanctuary's Refuge Denied on LP, and I finally listened to it, I'm like, holy shit, this sounds way better than the fucking CD. And the CD I have is definitely I don't know about original, but you know somewhere along there it wasn't like within this reissue stage that yeah. we're at currently. And so, like, there was just a drastic difference between the different formats that, uh, you know, just, oh, and there's the Central Media one right, right here. Like, so has that been something you've noticed that, like, the, the quality, though, of Signs of Life, it, has it been different? Or or am I just hearing other things that are going over my head? Um, man, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not a CD guy at all. So <laughs> I I probably, um, I might have heard the, the um, Central Media released once when it came out but I, I haven't heard it since i can tell you that i just I'm, I'm totally a vinyl guy i didn't you know i hated how that time period the early 90s they tried to uh phase out vinyl and give you only the cd option and um, yeah that that's just uh to me was complete bullshit you know and uh we even had a side band me and this guy one of the guys from devastation called killing machine and yeah, we wrote a machine. song about that you know like how they're pushing the you know but anyway um so I, I couldn't, the technical stuff, I couldn't even tell you, you know, because I've only heard really the vinyl, or that's the, the thing that's embedded in my brain, you know. I, I couldn't tell you how the CD compares to it, because 
I've maybe had one or two listens at the most, you know. Well, something I, I would add to that, Reaper, is when CDs started coming into play. I know um, some of they used to advertise a lot on the CDs because tapes were or vinyl or tapes were like the only options forever, obviously, yeah. when I was growing up. And so when CDs became a thing, and obviously I didn't get CD player till way late, um, they would say how like, oh yeah, a remastered sound for CD. Or, so it almost reminds me of how it is today, where you got to now remaster for vinyl because yeah, yeah. everyone's doing 16-bit, 41 you know, hertz or whatever yeah, yeah. for, for um for a CD and whatever CD quality, um, and then you got a master for vinyl and you know do yeah, what you need to do, really get double the it base all mono, all that. Yeah, um, I think it was the same thing then. I think they were saying, "Hey, look, we can make this sound so much better on this format. Um, check it out." And I think they were like going to those means of like remastering it just for CD or you know what right, I'm saying? right. Well, then even more so than you know that's fine and Danny that you know so he, we have we, we just described how Century Media has done that album and then uh, well Idolatry was interesting too because that was you know being probably the, like we said the milestone and having the bigger label like right. the when it came to reissuing that then you guys I, th I think it was more of a self reissue where it's got a different cover it's got a two I think live bonus or aren't there like studio re-records of songs on there or what was oh, the story beyond uh, that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're talking about that 2008 reissue. Yeah, yes. That pretty much was done by us because um, that was a brief moment in time where we were, there was a, more or less a reunion. I don't even like to acknowledge it because it turned out so piss poor. But Yeah, um, I was going to ask you about it. I saw articles <laughs> like about, you know, in 2008, yeah, we were talking about it. It, it, it turned out that um, it was at the time of MySpace and this and that when, all of a sudden, you already had internet, now you got MySpace, so it kind of shrinks the world even more. And we started getting um, a friend of mine from who used to be in writing corps. Um, man, I want to say it was Steve Murphy who did it. But anyway, one of my friends up in Dallas made, uh, and sorry, Steve, if it wasn't you, but he made a devastation, like a fan page on MySpace. He says, you guys, uh, you got to have this because people just are, um, you know, these younger kids they're digging up all the old bands and relics and stuff and yeah and it just you know just put your songs on there and let people listen to it what have you so he did it and ran it for a couple of months and then he says dude i'm getting too many questions and stuff and there's just i'm gonna turn it over to you so i he showed me how to work it and everything and uh, there was you know just some interest and so uh people wanted us to come play some festivals in uh in europe and um at first, it was like, yeah, whatever, you know, that's just, that ship has sailed. And then the more I started thinking about it, I was like, wow, you know, it, it might be kind of cool, you know. And so I approached Dave Burr, and um, he just wasn't into it at the time and just said said no, basically. And then uh, I still kind of wanted to do it, to just to go play Europe and do those festivals. So uh, I called Henry, and uh, he was the other guitar player. He was definitely into it, and... Um, our very, very first bass player, Alex Dominguez, who plays on the first two demos, uh, but not the album, uh, he was the one in Annihilator. Uh, yeah, he, he said he was down for it. And then, um, so we needed another guitar player and a drummer. Couldn't find a drummer, so Alex got the drummer from his current band in Corpus, and that guy did it. And then we ended up asking Walt who was the guitar player from Riding Corpse. He was familiar with our songs because uh, he was he was sound man on quite a few of those tours we did in the late 80s. So, you know, he knew the songs, so we got him. And um, so we kind of reformed and uh, went to went to Europe and played some shows. And uh, it just, it wasn't the same, you know. It wasn't the same band, same people. Uh, just wasn't really that good of a vibe, to be honest with you. So um, we came back and then... Uh, we got we got on a U.S. tour, opening for Soulfly. <laughs> believe oh it or wow! Not. And uh, did about um, it was supposed to be like a forty day tour. Uh, after ten shows, Alex quit and went back home. And then uh, after a show in Flint, Michigan, I said that's it. I quit and and I went back home too. And and that was it. It just wasn't um, it wasn't it wasn't good. It wasn't feeling it. Didn't the band didn't have the energy it used to have wasn't intense live like it used to be it was just uh, you know and i'm all for it, it has to be real you know and right too many bands get back together and reform just just to do it. i don't know if it's for the uh 
recognition or publicity or for to fulfill something, but it just, I mean, I'd say one out of a hundred can recapture what they had right. 70s or 80s or, and it's just, you know, why do it if you're just going through the motion? So yeah, it, it didn't last long at all. But in that time period, we did, we, we knew how great idolatry was and maybe a lot of people didn't have it and would like it. So um, a buddy of mine has a label called Rocket Drone out of San Antonio and we talked with him and worked out a deal. He reissued it and um, we took some to the shows and sold them and you know what have you. But uh, it was just trying to get idolatry some more exposure because when it came out at the time in 91 with Combat, it, like you know, we already talked about earlier, it was just a piss poor time for metal and we thought, hey, maybe with this resurgence, you know, people would be into it and it sold some copies, but you know, whatever. But that was the deal with the, the re reformation in 2008. So this is kind of taking a topic elsewhere, but it's funny you mentioned Soulfly and Max and whatever. Because uh, didn't you guys do the first Sepultura tour uh, their first time yeah. in the U.S.? Yeah, we did. Um, the Beneath the Remains, their first time in America. Yeah, it was uh, That'd have been crazy. Sepultura, Faith or Fear, and us. Uh, yeah, we did that whole tour with them and obviously became good friends with them. And you know, still to this day, we every now and then we see them. But yeah, that we did do their first U.S. tour. That's we, awesome. You're all correct. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and so we and we definitely confirmed at least what I was keeping tallies of. That, like we said, there's idolatry. Definitely, the album people probably know most, even devoid of the you know, like you said, being a crappy time for metal. Because off camera, we confirmed that the Cyst did a cover. Yeah, another band we couldn't name did a cover of uh, Souls of Sacrifice. Um, so they were, these are all the songs from Idolatry. Yep. And then obviously the album you decide to reissue is Idolatry. It's the Idolatry world here and. Then yeah. everything you just described basically dissipates this whole reunion, but it didn't entirely because then there's a band playing Devastation and uh, it's called Idolatry. Idolatry. Yeah, what's the I yeah guess. like why why did because it, it didn't sound like anybody was retaining the Devastation reins like so why would it be like uh, somebody else I, I thought Dave's involved I think somebody right? yeah somebody else was involved you know from the station know was it, but. involved but it was one of those like super group things where it's like not really the guy you would want it's like yeah, if it think, doesn't have Dev Rodney it's not well, really it doesn't have Rodney or Dave then yeah, yeah. or, or like uh, the other one the yeah, other Dave, yeah not Lozano yeah. so uh, yeah why is there a, an idolatry and not just uh, devastation uh, well that whole deal is is none of us that's Dave Lozano the right. guy he knows our drummer from that album um, that's his wanting to play those songs from the album that he played on and wanting to do it. And, you know, um, it's, you know, we don't have the best history. He, he kind of holds a grudge for being kicked out on tour and somehow he thinks it's entirely my fault where, but it was a band with the band was always democratic. We voted four to zero and everybody wanted him out. And, but because I was more or less the leader or the head of the band, whatever, you know, I get the, the blunt of the blame from him, but, uh, you know, and so I think, like you said, he's been on a tour manager, and he's been uh, roadie, and, and, you know, he's constantly touring, from what I hear, like yeah. you said. He's working, and, um, yeah. you know, it's probably, you know, he. I'm sure he tells people, hey, I, that Devastation album, I played drums on it, and, you know, because, you know, usually you don't necessarily see this guy and know where he's from or whatever from a band of that small of a stature and I guess throughout the years he, he probably got the itch of if he's always on the road you know he got the itch to play right. again and um, instead of making a new band writing his own songs well here you go I, I played drums on this album so I got the right to to call my band this album name and go out and play and you know what have you um, it's None of us from Devastation endorsed it. Dave Berg was really pissed about it, but yeah, I'm sure. I told him, dude, whatever, just let him do it. People know that that's not Devastation. Right. And, you know, it is It is what it is, and, and you know, who cares what he does, you know? I mean, but, yeah, it's not really nothing to do with Devastation, not authorized. It has the drummer who played on the album and a bunch of guests, if you will. So yeah. that's the gist of that. Yeah, I, uh, well, I was in Nunslaughter for a good stint, and we – played a fest in la and idolatry was playing it oh really and i was of course 
slightly excited and then i oh, kind yeah. of figured it all out and i'm like oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, dave, you sorry dave i don't want to but i, but I wasn't yeah. I, I just like all right i don't all right i think i tried even watching i'm like oh that's like rodney didn't play guitar so that's not right because that was my number one question is like is it you know it's it's tra- like i said it's, it's it, for as much as rodney described the vocals and the process of that yeah it's then like the key moment that kind of defines it though too right so it's like well without them then it's just like well who cares yeah and i it's just cover band at that point yeah. <laughs> yeah well guests like you said but so then now i'm, I'm just curious to now basically in, if we had a timeline of this conversation we're at the point where the band's is obviously done they've reformed blah, blah 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 and somewhere along there there was a point where i was just at a show in cleveland it was uh like raven and uh anvil and st- I, I believe Bulldo or uh yeah yeah bulldo bulldozer. pile driver sorry bulldozer bulldozer wasn't here <laughs> pile driver um and then I, uh, a, f- a friend of mine Don of the Dead from Nunslaw he was like uh you like Devastation right like the singers here I'm like what like the the band we're t- talking about right like <laughs> not identical so, yeah 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 it's, it's like yeah no I was just like huh that that's what the hell would he be doing in Cleveland and uh yeah. and then whatever you know it didn't really think much of it i think i met you there and then it's like now it's like uh you know a good friend of ours jamie boulder he's like yeah i'm friends with uh, rodney from devastation it's like so like what the hell is your cleveland connection <laughs> basically uh, it's uh, yeah no it's basically just jamie man we've uh we met back um we can never pinpoint the date i don't know if it was either late 90s or 2000 but uh boulder was playing in texas and uh playing at uh, some little little bar down the street from my house and um, a friend of mine that I worked with was uh, singing for a local band and you know he invited me to the show and I went and um, so me and a buddy of mine I think like I was wearing a parallax shirt at the time and my buddy was wearing uh, I don't know something obscure Holocaust Witchfinder General and and of course, Jamie like made a beeline right over to me and like, "Hey, where'd you get that parallax shirt?" And I'm like, "Oh man, I I made it. I love these guys. One of my favorite bands." And he's like, "No shit, me too, man." And we start talking music, and it was like, "Oh wow, you know." And we had like an instant bond and connection. And so, of course, when I saw Boulder, I was like, I hadn't heard of them, and like, wow, these guys are killer. Kind of blew me away. So after the show, Jamie, uh, well, the whole band came over to my house and. He's like going through my records and like, oh god dang, you have the breaker from Canada. I've always wanted to hear this. Put it on, and we're jamming it and cranking it, and just like, man, this uh, you know friendship was formed on that night that has remained ever since. And so the show you speak of, uh, I think that was 2006 or seven. Yeah, yeah, me and my buddy right. Rob, we flew up to Cleveland for that show. Uh, yeah, it was Bill Peters, some kind of anniversary thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, of course, I uh, called up Jamie, like, hey man, we're coming to Cleveland. Can we stay with you? And yeah, sure, of course, you know, so we uh, came up, that that ended up to be one of the best weekends ever, because I don't know if you remember, but like Stars played the Friday night before that show, so we saw Stars, and then Saturday, we went to like an Indians baseball game, then went to the Raven Anvil show at night, and then Sunday, the Browns played, so like, man, we crammed all that shit in one weekend, and it was just like, it was one of the best weekends ever, but yeah, that's uh, that's when I met Jamie, and he's he's been my Cleveland connection, I mean, it's like, um, now I practically, that's my whole way from home. I'm up there, you know, oh. 10, 15 times a year, you know, wow. getting ready for the midnight shows or just hanging out, whatever. Or showing know. up at Hell's Dead Beggars buying <laughs> records and needing <laughs> yeah. some guys to buying help, records. help yeah, ship them out. From the source. <laughs> yeah. ship, them back for, ship them back for you or whatever. <laughs> no, it's just like, I'll be like sitting there all of a sudden, it's like, Jamie and you guys walk in, I'm like... I didn't know Rodney was in town. I didn't know Jamie was driving 30 minutes down here. A simple text could have used work. But, you know, it's even funnier because, like, you know, here you are, friends and stuff. And, like, you know, I'm still this, you know, like, how are you the one friends with Rodney? Because it's, uh, because he's like, when we're talking about devastation, he's like, you know, I'm like, what's your favorite devastation? He's like, I, I don't really know it all that well. Yeah. <laughs> and then recently he's like, I was listening to Idolatry, you know, pretty good album. It's like, you fucking poser. Like, what do you mean you you, you just you just heard it? <laughs> like, you're friends with the guy and you were like, it took me to like, maybe like, oomph you up. Like, maybe you should check out what he did previously. <laughs> yeah. That's hey, Jamie. Jamie, Jamie yeah. you got to give him credit. He likes talented bands. He's got, he's got a good ear. Man. He knows, he knows his music. 
Wow, I, I, I didn't. I, you're you're saying this lack of talent. I heard talent. I you know I, I thought there was some impressive hell even on Violent Termination. There's some uh, killer leads on there. Like it's not like it's just like total. It's like a total suck fest and like everybody's like total <laughs> slop. You know, I mean, you know, talking about like South American kind of stuff. It right. definitely it held together better than some of that stuff. Sure. You know, um, so I, I, in yeah, fact, it's I'm kind of pre- prehistoric sound, and you got it right. Like, yeah, arcade. You you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Well, the prehistorics are great though because like th- that is what it is because I've always made that argument where like especially like the death metal world like as crappy as your recording was made you the cooler th- that you would be so like you know I've always made that argument like in a way that's like cheating because it's like you know you, you you could just if you go and take a, a boom box and let it blow the speaker like of course that's gonna sound ugly but if you were, were a band that went into a really high production uh studio and, and like balance it out and then still retain some ugliness through character and sound it's like that would be the ultimate ugliness and in a way that's right. kind of what the first dev- or, or any devastation record or a lot of the stuff that we even described is to me anyway like i don't know i mean i, I know the demos obviously have that but uh well where i was definitely going with that though <laughs> is some crowd interaction that you know here we have idolatry is available signs of life is available and then i guess if you are, are special enough and you can get a hold of rodney and he'll look in his closet he might find <laughs> you a, a violent termination lp uh like he did for me which is fucking sweet and i've misplaced it in the organization that is now unorganized he uh, just moved through me moving yeah. yeah he moved well i was gonna bring it though i was gonna bring it here i had to complete the set but uh you know but the, the demos where i was able to find so you know, but it, so we put it all together that you got Violent termination that needs to be reissued. So that album. <laughs> then you got. I mean, dude, there's fucking. There's six. There's uh, yes, five songs here on contaminated, and then there's another version of it, and then there's freaking what, like seven on uh, violent termination demo that, like I said, you know, you came confirmed its existence on uh, metal archives and destined to death demo. Like th- these are long demos. People is what I'm getting at. That this is plenty of content here to make shit. This is like a double disc right here. Just yeah, just these demos, sure. and then if you had that unreleased recording, that let's show some love to those recordings. That we need to re- we need to make a, a project here and put it all together and have it out. So if you're one of those nerds like me, because you made it to the end of this freaking long ass interview, <laughs> and I'm even here telling you this, well then let it be known in the comments that fuck yeah, this is what I want, and we need to start putting it together, and this might be the place to do it. So. um but that is, that for me that I I've, I've totally nerded out. How about you, Tommy? Yeah, no, this is cool, man. Like yeah. I said, I've always been a fan of idolatry, and then you know, gone back over the years, and it was just something that when this was coming up, I was like, well, let me go back to Violent Termination because I definitely wasn't so familiar with that. But Signs of Life, I remember it was just nice to get a refresh, and idolatry was the one that inter- introduced me early on. You know, when I was uh, coming up because I came up in those in the early 90s or whatever uh, into the extreme stuff. So yeah, this was educational. So this is always good for me. Yeah. Yeah. And into the darkness it was. So definitely true. So, oh man, there you are, her viewer, listener, whatever you are, uh, consuming this content. Because if you like this, then there's plenty of other stuff here on the channel for you to check out. So please do all that crap that I shouldn't have to remind you of, but will remind you of. Subscribe, share, like, all that great stuff. Reaper Metal Productions, redefining darkness, devastation. And when you do all that, that means we'll have everything we need to talk to you next time. <laughs>